I'd like to start out by asking if you could raise your hand if you've dealt with raster satellite data in some form. All right, quite a few. Okay, uh, and how many of you know something or are familiar with projections? All right, that means I can skim through some of my talk. Um, I'd like to start out by acknowledging some of the uh, other core SatPy developers. I'd also like to thank the PyTroll and SatPy users for being very patient for our last release. I'd also like to thank uh, one of my supervisors, Kathy Strabla. She's been very supportive of all of my open source work. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a software developer at the Space Science and Engineering Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I work on various uh, software development teams like the CSPP team, where I'm the core developer of the Polar Grid and GeoDegrid projects, which are basically command line tools around the features of SatPy. I am also on a project called SIFT, which is a GUI application for visualizing uh, satellite data, which uses the VizPy library. I have a poster on that later today. I'm also a maintainer of the VizPy library, which I will have an update for at the plenary session tomorrow. And obviously, I'm a maintainer and core developer of the SatPy project and a member of the PyTroll community. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about what uh, we work with in the PyTroll community or in the remote sensing satellite imagery community, uh, how SatPy makes our work easier, and then some uh, short examples of some cool stuff you can do with SatPy. So uh, we work with weather satellite data. Um, it's used a lot for forecasting or maybe feeding forecast models to get better predictions. It can be used by researchers and scientists to uh, do whatever science they want to do. They're typically worried about uh, stuff like water vapor in the air, temperatures of the oceans, uh, types of clouds, that kind of thing. Um, you can also make pretty pictures from satellite data, uh, good for putting on public facing websites. Um, and in the PyTrail community, a lot of the core developers are in charge of operational processing at their organizations, where their job is to take whatever satellite data they have available to them, do something to it, and write it out so that the above use cases can actually use that data. Uh, here is an example image of 16 channels from the ABI instrument on board the GOES uh, East satellite, which is a geostationary satellite, so it's always looking at the same region. Uh, each channel or band, uh, there's 16 of them, uh, they measure the emitted or reflected electromagnetic radiation coming off the Earth. Um, each wavelength can show uh, different features or properties of the atmosphere or uh, of the Earth, the land. Um, so if you combine them in different ways, you can get different information out of it. You can also combine them to make uh, pretty RGB pictures. Uh, here is a true color image of the Earth uh, from that same ABI data from the previous slide. Um, it's meant to represent what the Earth looks like to, uh, to, the, to a human. So greens are greens, blues are blues, that kind of thing. Um, our solution for that from the PyTroll community is the SatPy package. We just released version 0.9 last week. If I have the time, 0.9.1 should come out this week. Uh, Linux, Mac, Windows, uh, it should work on all those. It's also available, uh, you can install it with PIP and Conda via CondaForge. Um, so how does SatPy make our lives easier? Uh, the main thing that SatPy is trying to do is wrap all of the common things that we do in uh, simple interfaces so that with one or two lines of code, you can get a lot of your work done. And, uh, you don't have to duplicate code every time you want to use a different sensor or write to a different output format. Um, we also use X-Ray and Dask, which uh, gives us really good performance. Dask lets us do lazy operations and also split that work across multiple workers, uh, threads, cores. Um, another important part of SatPy is the PyTroll community behind it, and I'll talk about more, or talk, th talk about that more later. First, I'll talk about the common interfaces, and this is kind of filling in the do stuff uh, bubble of that diagram I had before. Um, one of the most important things 
that SatPy does, because it can be super difficult and annoying, is reading satellite data for formats. Uh, depending on where you get your data from, who made it, what satellite it's for, what sensor it's for, what command line flags they used, you might have completely different files that you have to read. And so uh, you end up having to modify your code in weird ways just to read a file. Uh, maybe you're lucky if you have NetCDF, but even then, uh, there's weird schemes and organizations and dependencies between the files. And SetPy is trying to uh, abstract that away as best as it can. Um, so in SatPy, the way we do this is uh, we have a scene object. Uh, it acts as the container for all the satellite data that you want to work with uh, for a particular geographic region and a specific time. Once you have that scene object, which you create with uh, specifying what format your data is in and the file names that you're providing it, uh, you can load a certain channel just by giving the name. So in this case, channel one and channel two uh, from that ABI instrument that I showed before. Uh, I also mentioned that those channels have an associated wavelength that they measure. Uh, sometimes people are more familiar with the wavelength rather than the channel name. So you can pass the channel name to that too. Uh, in this case, the 0.46 micron, 0.62 micron, uh, which correspond to channel one and channel two. In some cases, the files you're reading provide multiple resolutions or uh, multiple levels of calibration for the same data. Um, to get around that, SatPy provides a data set ID object, which you can provide to the load method to kind of wrap up all of those details to get the specific uh, data that you want from the file. Once you have loaded it, uh, the scene acts like a dictionary, and you can just request whatever data set you asked for. Uh, if you're familiar with X-Array, this output should look similar. This is just an X-Array data array object backed by a Dask array. And uh, you have attributes, metadata that we got from the file. Some of them are added by SatPy to make the data easier to use uh, either by SatPy or by the users. Uh, try to standardize some things. There's also a show method if you just want a quick look of your data. Uh, the next common thing that we run into is wanting to make RGB composites. You, can buy the, you combine those individual bands that I talked about before, uh, do different things with them, and you can make a nice pretty image where you are assigning colors essentially to uh, specific uh, properties or features in the data. In SatPy, this is just like a lo loading another channel. You can load a pre-configured composite uh, just by giving the name, and it's another data array object. Another part of this RGB step is adding some kind of correction, uh, removing certain things from the data if you want. So in this case, on the left, we have a uh, pure true color image where we didn't apply any corrections to it. And on the right, we've applied quite a few. Uh, things like correcting for the angle of the sun or certain atmospheric scattering. Uh, again, this comes down to just loading a, a pre-configured composite by the name. I titled this slide, Do the Impossible, because before we used Dask, I could not create that uh, image on the right in the previous slide. I could not do it on my laptop. It would run for like 35 minutes, hit Slack, or Slack, um, hit swap, and uh, it would just crash using too much memory. If you think about all of the complex operations that go into that and think about how much data you're processing at full resolution for an ABI full disk, that full earth view, uh, you have about 22,000 rows, 22,000 columns, eight bytes for a 64-bit float, and three input bands, and that's just for the output image. You're at 10 and a half gigs. So you can see how a laptop with 16 gigs of memory can easily run out of uh, space when you're working with that much data. Um, but with the Dask-based version, I can load, compute, save this to a GeoTIFF in six to eight minutes on my laptop. It's made a big difference. Uh, since a lot of you mentioned that you know what projections are, I'm hoping that you're okay with me kind of skimming through resampling and explaining what that is and different resampling algorithms. Um, the important part is uh, I can, well, I, I hope I can give you a small example to, uh, to show why it's helpful and how SatPy does it. So uh, in this case, I'm loading data from a different instrument, uh, the VIRS instrument from the SNPP satellite. 
using the Veers SDR reader. Uh, I'm loading a single time chunk and loading the IO4 band, and this is what you get. You might recognize Cuba, it's upside down. You'll also notice that there's uh, this white fringy effect on the sides that's actually from a property of the satellite and the way it scans. It's called the bow tie deletion effect. Uh, it's done to reduce the amount of data that has to be uh, sent from the satellite to the ground. And if we want to, it's, it's not an image that scientists want to use. Uh, it's not uh, something that looks good. It's not, uh, it's got a lot of extra effects that you don't want to see. So you resample it. Uh, in SatPy, after you've created that scene object, you run resample, and you have an image that actually looks like uh, contiguous data. Um, a little more useful. Lastly, uh, one of the main features of SatPy is saving to different formats. Whether you want to use a GIS program or uh, some web mapping service, you want to put a PNG image on a website, you need to save it to different formats. Um, all of these have their own little uh, specialties about them. Um, SatPy, again, it's a simple function. Uh, save data sets, provide, you specify what format you want to write to, maybe some extra attributes, uh, extra keyword parameters, and a destination, that kind of thing. Um, I should also mention that because we're using Dask, if the format supports it, we try to uh, use as much of Dask as we can, where we can write individual chunks of arrays from multiple threads to a single file at the same time. You can get uh, some pretty good performance improvements by doing this. Uh, so we do this with GeoTIFF using the Raster.io library. Um, so if we kind of take all of these chunks together and we describe a, a basic workflow here where I'm taking ABI data, loading multiple channels, loading multiple RGB composites, um, it comes down to four or five lines of code. I titled the slide The Basics because really that's the basics of SatPy. You have five lines of code. But if you think about what's going into this, this is um, huge projects that people spend time on. They have uh, all this duplicated code for, oh, I'm not using ABI, I'm using AHI now. And you have to rewrite a huge chunk of your code to do that. In SatPy, you're just switching the name of the reader and providing different files. Um, if you want to load different bands, different RGBs, just switch whatever name you're providing it. So it's made our lives uh, incredibly easy, <laughs> well, not for developing on SatPy, but uh, for using it. Um, so it's come down to just a few lines of code. So I will uh, go on to more of the fun stuff. So these are things that aren't uh, maybe, maybe not everyday things that you might want to do with satellite data, but uh, it's something we've been playing with. So these are kind of experimental features. Uh, we created a multi-scene object, which as the name suggests, you provide multiple scenes to it and you can act on them at the same time. So here I'm loading multiple VIRS passes. Uh, I think I forgot to mention uh, SMPP is a polar orbiting satellite, so it goes around the poles and for a specific region you might get multiple passes uh, throughout the day. So if we resample to a pre-configured grid that I just have on my uh, hard drive, the, this 211E grid that I have, and then use the special blend method, I can actually stack the passes on top of each other, and for my region that I'm interested in, I can get uh, more, um, more coverage of data. Next, uh, I actually have to switch to not full screen because reveal.js doesn't want to play nice. Um, you can also save animations with, um, with SatPy with this multi-scene object. We're using the image, <laughs> image IO library underneath. Uh, and so here I'm making an MP4 video, and now it doesn't want to let me scroll down all the way. All right, you guys don't get to see the movie, I guess. So you can make a movie. Um, this is not SatPy, this is Chrome or something. Um, but you can make a movie. Uh, Hopefully you can see in the code that it's just a few lines, few lines to do this. Wow, this is worse than before. Um, another thing you can do is, since we're just dealing with data array objects from X-Array, you can plot these however you want. We also have special area definition objects uh, that define our projections and the extents of the, uh, your data set. Um, we s added recently a two-cardipi CRS 
method to convert that to a Cartopy compatible CRS object. And then you can just pass that to matplotlib and do whatever Cartopy stuff you want to do. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, one of the last things I want to talk about is the PyTrol community that has created SatPy and that works with SatPy. Um, I can talk about all the features of SatPy, and yeah, they're cool, but I would argue that the community is more important. Uh, if you don't belong to a community in the field that you do, join one, start one, something. Uh, the PyTrol community, we have a community website, we have a mailing list, we have a Slack team uh, for support for our, the packages we produce, but also just for sharing ideas. Maybe, it, maybe they're not code, uh, maybe they're just ideas, maybe it's talking about the World Cup, because uh, most of them are Europeans. Um, we try to have workshops, or they're, they're kind of like sprints twice a year, where you can, um, you can come learn more about PyTrol, try to get it into your, get our packages into your workflow, um, or if you want to, you can contribute features. Uh, you'll be sitting next to the core developing, development team. Um, so, if uh, SatPy sounds interesting to you, come join us on Slack. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, I'll end with this video of the contributions of SatPy um, over time uh, from the original MPOT package that it was based on. And I'll skip ahead to like 2015 when I joined because that's more interesting. <laughs> um, but if you watch it, you'll see there's a few contributors here and there, and then they have a workshop, and it's like 20 different people. Um, so, thank you. While the eye candy plays, we've got plenty of time for questions, and now it's time for me to get some exercise. Hi, so I'm an interested user in satellite data. I've used some, but I don't know a lot about the actual stuff you need to know in the background. And one of the things I've had troubles with is finding <laughs> the data in the first place. Yeah. I don't know if, I'm, if you talked about that or not, but how do you have recommendations for that, or is that tied into SatPy at all? Like it, Finding it, it, all the different data out there and then getting it into some usable that method. That is a good question, and it's something that's been coming up more and more. Uh, the more we advertise SatPy, we have new users uh, like you who they want to do something, but they don't have the data. Um, I do not have a very good answer for you. Um, my Every instrument, every satellite has its organization or contractor that's associated with it. Um, I know that a lot of NASA and NOAA websites try to provide some web interface for downloading the data. Uh, UMetSat has their, um, their members that they have access to. UMetSat's streams of data. Um, I also work at a university where we deal a lot with satellite data, so I kind of have easy access to it sometimes. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Questions? We have plenty of time. And I was worried about time. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to know what the, uh, you, I, you'd have to go back several slides that where you had the four, uh, you know, pictures of, of Earth. Mm. And the one that was kind of greenish, I, I was just curious what that was supposed to display. That, yep, right there. The, the upper right lower one. Right. Upper right is uh, that is called an overview image. It's something that the Swedish Meteorological Hydrological Institute in Sweden uh, created. Um, they can provide you a better history of that, um, but it's something that they've been using for a long time. I used it here because it's really simple to make because it's just three bands. Um, no, but the low, low, lower right. Oh, lower right. I'm sorry. Uh, lower right is an air mass RGB. Uh, we tried to add uh, UMetSat, uh, the European MetSat uh, organization, has a list that they've had for a long time of different combinations of uh, wavelengths of bands that produce RGBs that are interesting in some way. Uh, so we tried to add as many as we could for every satellite uh, instrument. And so that's one of those air mass 
and actually, if we want to go to another question, I might have that same movie that I had before, but this is the R -mass, or air mass RGB. If I can make it bigger. So this is what that channel one on the website was supposed to look like, but this is an air mass RGB that I made like yesterday. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so how do you chunk your, uh, your images? Uh, do you mean how do we determine the chunk size or how do we do it? Do, just what, what yes. exactly? Um, so <laughs> we determine the chunk size. We did a couple tests. And right now, it's a static value. It's something that we want. It, you can also configure it with an environment variable. But um, we do hope to have an in Python way to configure it. Uh, or pass it to your reader object to specify it. Um, it's either based on the format, so like polar orbiting satellites, you usually get chunks of data at a time, and so we just use those because that's what it is. Uh, otherwise, we use uh, 4096 by 4096 pixels for something like this uh, ABI full disk image, which that was just based on testing, and it seemed to perform well on most of our laptops. Yeah. I've, I've got an easy one. So PySat, I understand. Sat for satellite. Yeah. What, pie troll? <laughs> <laughs> pie troll was started by uh, Scandinavian organizations. They wanted to attach something, have meaning in the name that represented Scandinavian something. So they went with trolls. And so it's not internet troll, it's Scandinavian troll. Um, yeah. That was actually a harder question than some of the other ones. Maybe we need like a history lesson on the, on the website to describe that. Um, does the software package only support Earth-based satellite imagery, or do you also support planetary flyby imagery of Earth? Um, pull as requests as are welcome. <laughs> um, right now, we it, a lot of our f uh, focus, just because it's what our jobs are around, our atmospheric weather type satellites. I've, I've actually got a really simple question at all. How did you make that uh, cool animation at the very end showing the growth of the package? What was used to um, that? I think it's pronounced Gorse. Um, It's a, it's a C application or C++, I think. Uh, you can install it, and then I think you give it, I think you give it a Git repository. Cool. It's, it also works for subversion, and it'll just do this. There's a lot of different options to it. You can pass it to FFmpeg to configure all the extra little niceties. I know what I'm wasting my time on later. Yeah. Um, we, still, we still have a little bit more time for questions. I feel like I forgot to talk about something if I finish so early. Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, so, you, so you talked about the pie troll, what the troll is referring to, but how is, I mean, what, how is the mission bigger than PySat itself? It sounds like they're a set. super set of, 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 of what you yeah. guys are doing. So uh, SatPy is kind of the highest level, most abstract library that we have, and it uses all of our other libraries or other things in the Python ecosystem to do what we need to do. Um, so it usually comes down to somebody who wants to add a feature to SatPy or they want something to do the work that they do. They'll talk to us and say, hey, do you have something that does this? Well, no. Do you want to make a package for it? Okay, sure. Um, so we have like a small package for dealing with uh, images and uh, adding colors to them, adding color maps. Um, we have packages, uh, the resampling stuff that SatPy uses, uses a Pi resample library. Um, so we just have little libraries that kind of the PyTroll group of developers uh, manage. Are there any issues running this software on the cloud and accessing cloud-based imagery? There shouldn't be. I will say, since I have so much time, and since Matt Rockland's here, um, 
one issue that we have is we have trouble getting the most performance out of uh, saving files from multiple workers. So I've had a lot of trouble using Dask's uh, cluster or multi-process uh, schedulers because it's really difficult to both open and write to a file quickly, but also do it from multiple things at the same time or near the same time. Um, but there shouldn't be as far as just running it on something and accessing files. As long as, right now we're uh, limited to files that you have on a local disk. So, depending on where you're running your code and how you're getting it. Um, yeah, I didn't have a question necessarily, but I, I just wanted to make a comment or, um, regarding the first question about data access. I work for NOAA, satellite data distribution isn't my thing, but um, a lot of the, like the GOES data, for instance, that you were demoing is all available on um, Amazon. So they have an open data program. I believe it's called Earth on AWS. Um, I think there's, it's also available on Google. So I encourage you to check out Earth on AWS. NOAA has its own you know, data access portals, but um, you'll probably have the quickest results just um, looking at Earth on AWS or Earth on Google. <coughs> Earth on AW, I believe, yeah. Thanks. That's awesome. That's exactly the way it should go. <laughs> Um, time for one more question. So have you actually run it on EC2 itself going on with this? Because this seems a perfect uh, example of where you could use the cloud to do file by file multiprocessing. No. Um, I guess one of the reasons for that is a lot of the times uh, the PyTrol developers are uh, working at organizations where they kind of have to keep right. stuff local, yep. and so we have our servers that are running all of this operational stuff. And you said before using Dask, um, it took something like 35 minutes and crashed. Yeah. So how much speed up have you gotten by using Dask as a back end, or is it just a memory thing that it solved? Uh, it's a speed thing too. Um, I do not have the numbers right now, like if I ran Dask just single thread uh, I do not recall, but yeah. Okay, can we thank the speaker again?